Well, I love the Christmas season. I bet you do too. But one of the things I've noticed at the Christmas season is that we don't like to owe anybody. Have you ever gotten, and by that I mean this, have you ever gotten a gift from somebody that you weren't expecting to get a gift from? Anybody? You know? And when they give you that gift, <clears throat> your immediate thought isn't like, wow, Merry Christmas to me. Your immediate thought is, uh-oh, I didn't get you anything. Isn't it, right? Have you ever had that experience? And then you're thinking, oh, no, now I'm obligated to this joker. You know, I, I, didn't, I didn't think about them. And then you think next year, when the next year rolls around, you're thinking, I wonder if so-and-so is going to give me a gift. And so you're, you're, you're in that dilemma of, okay, I probably ought to get them something this year because they got something for me last year, but I'm not sure what to get this year because I don't want to, like, go over gifting, right? And I don't want to give something that's way over the top for them, but I don't want to, like, under gift because if they give me something nice, I don't want to have them, you know, like a white elephant gift gift type thing, you know? And so you, we, we have this thing where we don't want to owe anybody anything. I remember my first, I bumped into this a very simple way. There was a family many, many years ago that uh, this was before we did like Christmas cards. And this is, you know, I'm, I'm a young adult at this time, but I'm thinking, hey, I'm going to send a Christmas card to this family because they've been a lot to us. I just want to say hello and, you know, Merry Christmas. And so we send them a Christmas card, right? Innocent thing. Seven days later, guess what I got? A Christmas card from them. You know how many times we got a Christmas card from them? One time, because we sent them something, and they just like, you know what, I don't even want to owe you a Christmas card, so here's your Christmas card in return, you know? <clears throat> but it's not just a Christmas thing, is it? We, we do this all the time. You go out to dinner with somebody, and, and, and unexpectedly, they pick up the tab, right? And you're not thinking, oh, wow, <clears throat> that was great. I, I love that. Because what do you do? You say, well, well I'll, I'll get the what? I'll get the next one, or, or I'll get the tip if you're cheap. You'll say, I'll get the tip, <laughs> right? <clears throat> You can get the next one too, but I'll always get the tip. I tip, you buy. That's, that's the way we'll do this. But, but again, we just feel like, you know what, I, I don't want to owe anybody anything, and that's fine. I, I, I get it. We, we want to be able to pay our own way. We want to you know, carry our own weight and that kind of thing. And that's not a bad thing, I, I suppose. But, but what happens is we, we bring this natural tendency to not to want to owe anybody. We bring that tendency into our relationship with God too. I mean, we know that we're not perfect. We know that, you know, I, I can't live up to a perfect standard, but I can do a little, you know, I, I can do a little bit. And so what we try to do is we try to come to God with bringing our end of the bargain. We try to come to God with, with living up to, you know, whatever standard we think that we need to live up to God, thinking, you know what, <clears throat> I don't want to be a complete wreck in front of God. And so I, I'm going to make myself just a little acceptable, as acceptable as I can make myself to him. And because we've got this whole idea that, you know what, God's perfect and I don't want to, I want to come empty handed uh, to God. And really, you know what we're, we're on at that point? We're on the path that all religion leads us to. It leads us to a path where we're trying to work ourselves up and make ourselves acceptable to God or make ourselves worthy to God. And what happens when we're on this path, and all the world religions do this, when we're on this path, we find out that our reward depends on us. That whatever reward I'm going to get from God or however God's going to respond to me is really dependent upon, upon me. Like, if I live up, if I, if I do my end of the bargain, then God will come in with his end of the bargain. And so the reward is really up to me. And then the flip side of that is also true, that my punishment is up to me too. Like, if, if I really botch this whole thing, then, man, I'm really going to get whacked by God on something like this, right? And so we, we bring this whole idea that there is something that I can do to make myself acceptable to God. There is something that I can do to keep my end of the bargain. I know I can't get myself all the way there, but there's something that I can, that I can do to make myself worthy of God, that I can make myself acceptable to God. And really, the message of Christmas is, you know, that's just bogus. That's not, that's not true because... Here's the reality. Our worth is not defined by what we do. Our worth is not be defined by what we do. In, 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 instead, our worth is defined by what God has done for us. That God looks at us and he loves us so much that he decided to do something for us. It wasn't because we've done something and he's like, wow, look at them. They've really done, and I'm going to pat them on the back. This is what the scripture says, one of the most famous scriptures in all the Bible. For God so... <clears throat> Loved. It was love that motivated. God so loved the world that he gave his, only, his one and only son. In other words, he looked at us and he loved us right where we were, and he decided to act on our behalf. He gave his, his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life or every, eternal life. You know what this tells me? That, that he, we're not going to perish. That means that we're all on the road to perishing. That's what that means. That God looked down on us and realized, you know what? They're all perishing, and so I've got to do something. 
and they are worthy so much of me. They're, they're, they're worth so much to me that I'm going to act on their behalf. I'm going to act on their behalf. And so we don't have to make ourselves worthy. We're worthy, and God says you're worthy, and that's why he sends our son. This is what Romans uh, chapter uh, 5 says. Paul says this, but God demonstrates his own love for us. In other words, this is love is motivating factor that while we were what? It doesn't say while we were at our best, you know, on our best week, on our best month, and our best year, God did this. He says, as we were still sinners, while we were at our worst, Christ what? Died for us. You see, it's not something to where we have to come up and say, God, I'm going to do my end of the bargain. I'm going to bring, you know, all my best to you. And and, and I know that's not going to be quite enough, but it's going to get me part of of the way there. And God says, no, no, you don't understand. I I come to you because you're you're worth it to me, right? There's value. You're valuable to me. And so I'm going to act on your behalf. We don't make ourselves acceptable to God. We don't make ourselves worthy by what we do. God says, you're worth something to me, and therefore he acts and he does something for us. He does something for us. Now, last week we were in the Gospel of Luke. We're talking about the Christmas story. In Luke chapter 2, we looked at uh, verse 1 and following into into that. Today we're going to start out in verse 8, and we're going to go back to this passage, and really we're going to read a few verses here, but we're going to key in on one word, because when we understand the gravity of this one word and how how, how it really impacts us, it really could change the way that we view ourselves and our relationship or our approach to God. And when, when this goes from here, like you're going to say, yeah, 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 I know that, right? This is like no new information today. You're going to say, yeah, I know that. But when it goes from here to here, it changes the way that we relate to God. It changes the way that we approach God. And so if you've got your Bible and you want to follow along, Luke chapter 2, we're beginning in verse 8 where Luke writes, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. Now, remember last week we talked about uh, when you're in school and the PA system came on inside the classroom and says, you know, please send Johnny to the office, the principal wants to. All of a sudden you're like, "Uh uh-oh, this is not good, because the principal never wants to talk to me because I'm a good person. The principal always wants to talk to me because I've done something wrong. And so the angel appears and the, and the shepherds are terrified because God doesn't break in unless it's you know, like for a bad reason. And so they're terrified. But the angel says, hey, hey, hang on a second. Do not be afraid, all right? No reason to be afraid. I bring you good what? <clears throat> no, this is not bad news. This isn't like I'm, I'm here to wag my finger at you. I'm going to bring you good news that will cause what? Joy. You don't have to be afraid. This is going to be something that's going to bring you joy for all the people, not some of the people, not the religious people, not the good people, not the people who are doing their part and living up to their end of the bargain. It's like people don't even realize what God is going to do right here, but it's for all people and it's going to be a cause for great joy. And what's that cause? He says, today in the town of David, a what? A savior, not a king, not like a a helper, not a coach, not a mentor, not a boss, but a savior has been born to you. He is Messiah, the Lord. Now, uh, this word for savior, it could be translated deliverer, right? It'd be something that, that delivers you from something that's bad, all right? It's not like a pizza deliverer, all right? It's somebody who says, there's a, there's a bad situation and I'm going to rescue you. That's another way this word could be translated. It could be to rescue or it could be translated to redeem. And to redeem means to buy something back, all right? Uh, to purchase the freedom of something by way of payment. That's what that means. In other words, that God looks down on all of humanity, all people, not just you know certain kinds of people, but all people. And he says, you know what? Here's the thing. You need a savior. I'm just telling you, you need a savior. And I'm going to do this and I'm going to get all the glory for it because it's not about what you've done. It's not about how well you've lived or how much you deserve or how worthy you are. This is about what I'm choosing to do because I love you and I'm sending you a savior. And the reality is, we need to be saved, don't we? I I don't know if you've ever been in a situation uh, where you were way beyond your ability to help yourself in that moment. I've seen this on the internet. You've probably seen it on, sometimes there are natural disasters happen and and people need to be saved, right? They're they're out in the middle of a river and they can't get away and the rushing water just is is blowing everything by and and people go out there to save them. I've seen them when little Bambi gets stuck in a mud hole, you know? You've seen these little... 
<clears throat> these little videos on the internet, right? And, and all of a sudden, this whole group of people going to, 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 to rescue this baby deer that's in the middle of this mud and it can't get out and it's going to die because of the whole natural disaster. And they put this harness around this deer and they, they pull it out and they suck it out. And everyone's like, oh my God, they saved the deer, you know? And, and, but there's a moment in life when, when we find ourselves in that kind of situation where we say, how did I wind up here? And this is way beyond my ability to get myself out of. I remember one time when I was a kid, we went on vacation uh, down to Florida. We were at the beach and, and uh, my, you know, my parents said all the, hey, stay close to us. We don't, you know, there are a gazillion people out on the beach. We don't teach the loss. I was probably seven or eight at the time. And uh, we were out on the beach and I got on one of those little floaties, you know, those little rafts that, that floated. It's like a balloon that was only flat. It's not like the real, you know, sturdy things today. You could really actually sink on these things. But I'm in the ocean and I'm thinking, I'm going to go out there and I'm having fun. And I'm kind of keeping my eye on the shore. And I, I kind of had where my parents were. And then I, I drifted out a little bit, was out there and just kind of lollygagging around, you know, doing the little thing that eight-year-olds do in the water in the middle of the ocean. And then I kind of got confused. I was like, is that where my parents are? Is it, was it that building that we were in front of or was it that that one way down there. And I really didn't know, but I wasn't really concerned. I'm thinking, you know, I'm far enough out here that I, it's hard for me to see anymore. And so I, I'm just thinking, this is, this is kind of interesting. I'm out here, no one's bothering me. I'm out here by myself. And what I didn't realize was I was getting caught up in the currents. And I was in trouble, and I didn't even realize I was in trouble. I, I thought my parents might be concerned because they couldn't see me anymore, uh, but I wasn't that concerned that I couldn't see them anymore because that's what kids do. Like, yeah, I don't want my parents around. And then all of a sudden, as I'm out there just minding my own business, all of a sudden, somebody grabbed my raft and started yanking, and I thought, uh-oh, you know, they're trying to do something to me. What's going on? And I was afraid at first, and I was thinking, get away from me. And then I realized it wasn't just anybody. It was a, it was a person I had red on with a little cross on. It was a lifeguard. It was, the, it was the beach lifeguard. And he dragged me back in, and he pulled me back up onto the shore, and I realized that I was a really, really long way away from my parents. It took me forever to find them. I didn't realize how far out I had gone, and, and I didn't realize as a kid how much in danger I was. I was in danger of never seeing the shore again, and I just didn't know it. And yet somebody looked out, at me in the ocean and realize they're in trouble and they don't even realize it. And guess what? That individual out there needs to be saved. You ever been in that kind of situation? Well, all of a sudden you've just kind of drifted and drifted and drifted and, and you've kind of gotten confused about where you were and maybe your integrity kind of has, has been waning away and then all of a sudden you're, you're out and you're like, you can't, get, you can't find your bearings anymore. We all find ourselves in those situations where it, it dawns on us, you know what, this is, this is more than I can handle. This, this, this is a mess that I, that I really can't handle. And, the, and here's the strange thing. When we talk about the message of Christmas and when we say, you know what, we need a Savior, and we talk about that language, some of us say, you know what, I, I don't really want a Savior because that's somebody who's going to interrupt my life. They're going to mess up with my life. They're going to demand things from me, and I, I'm, I'm actually doing just fine on my own. Like, I, I've got it under control. I'm managing my life. It's going fine. Just leave me alone. And I don't mean to like be offensive or anything, but you need a savior. Like some of you today, you're in a position in life right now where you don't realize how bad and how far, how bad it is and how far you've drifted and how far you've compromised in your own life, in your own integrity, in your own relationships, with your own home, with your own marriage, with your own kids, with your own what. You don't realize how bad it is, and I'm just telling you, it's, it's worse than you think. And you need a Savior. You need a Savior. And it's not just that you need a Savior for eternity. Like, I think we all get, uh, get it that, that you know what, <clears throat> there's something beyond this life that I know. I mean, there's something beyond death, and, and, and I probably need help for that. But the reality is, you need a Savior not just for eternity, but you need a Savior right now for today. I love what Rick Warren says. He says this, you don't need a savior because you might die tonight. You need a savior because you have to live tomorrow. You need a savior because you have to live tomorrow. That sometimes we get in a situation where we think it's just out there someday, you know, that I'll need help in eternity. But the reality is, and some of you have bumped up against that, you realize, you know, I need saving right now. Not just saving my soul, but saving my life. And, and really, honestly, I need God to, to rescue me from me. 
and from the direction that I'm going. And when you experience that saving, there, there's something that happens between the relationship between uh, the saved and the Savior. There's something that happens between the person who's being saved and the person who is actually doing the saving. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where someone literally has saved your life, but, but you don't feel obligated to that person. Why? Because they saved your life. You're just like, oh my goodness, you, you rescued me. I could never thank you enough. Like, like for the rest of my life, my heart will be filled with gratitude towards you. And this is what God has done for us. He, he has given us a Savior, and there's something that happens when we understand the gravity of what's happened. Like, you know what? I realize now that it was a lot worse than I thought. Like, I didn't need a helper. I didn't need a coach. I didn't need an encourager. I needed, it was so bad, I needed a Savior. And what happens when I realize how much I've been rescued from, how much I've been spared of, I, it, it, all of a sudden, it, it, it elicits unsolicited devotion. You don't have to ask me to be grateful to that person. You don't have, if that person calls me up who's rescued me, I don't have to say, you know what, I don't know. I, 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 you need what from me? No, no. It's like, absolutely. I'll do anything I can because what? You say, I, like, I owe my life to you. I wouldn't be here without you. My marriage wouldn't exist without you. My, my family would be obliterated without your help. I mean, like, you rescued me from a pit absolutely, I'll do whatever I can, not because I feel obligated, but because, man, I'm just so grateful. And unsolicited devotion is what is elicited out of our heart. And not just that, but unfiltered emotion. Like there are times when we think about what somebody has done for us and it just, it, it touches us in a deep place. And sometimes, and sometimes when we think about what God has done for us and what he's saved us from, what he's rescued us from, there's just this unfiltered emotion that bubbles up. Sometimes you'll, you know, come into a, a situation or an environment like this and music is going on and, and you walk into your aisle and, and as you walk into your aisle, you'll notice somebody down the road, they're, they're crying and you're thinking, man, what's up with that? You know, they're a, they're a blubber basket case down here. You know what that is? There's something in that song, there's, there's a refrain that they're singing and it touches a deep part in their heart where they, it's taking them back to the reality of, oh my goodness, I was saved. Jesus saved me. He rescued me. He put my family back together. He put my marriage back together. He put my financial world back together. He saved me. It was way beyond my ability to handle. Way beyond my ability to handle. And so... You know, I was thinking about this message, trying to come up with a, you know, really nifty bottom line, but the bottom line is very simple, but very true. I need a Savior. That's the bottom line. I need a Savior. Say that with me. I need a Savior. Say it again. I need a Savior. Now, here, here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn to the person next to you and say, you need a Savior. Now, it's a whole lot more fun to say that to somebody else, isn't it? <laughs> They're like, oh, you're messed up, man. <laughs> you need big time help, you know? And, and it's easy for us to look at somebody else and say, oh, wow, they're messed up. I can see it. But, but it's hard for us to say, okay, I need a Savior. Like, I, I need a Savior. And here's the thing that this is, this is where we, this is where we really struggle because we're masters at trying to control our own life. We're masters of trying to control our relationships, our career path, our finances, our kids, our parents, you know, our neighbors. We're, we're masters of controlling and thinking, and this is the illusion. We think, you know what, I can like affect outcomes. Like if I get involved in this, I can turn the events of this person's life for my benefit or for their benefit or for somebody's benefit, but I'm really good at that. And some of you, you know, you don't want to admit that out loud, but on the inside, you're like, yeah, I am pretty good at that. Like when someone's going in a direction that you don't want them to go for whatever reason, maybe it's a selfish reason or maybe it's really for their benefit, you're like, yeah, I can get them to change. I can get them to change. And here's the thing, you, you try to do that long enough and eventually you'll push all those people away from you. You're going to be at the end of your life being alone because no one's going to be a want, to, want to be around you. Why? Because you've tried to control everything. And here's the thing, and some of you have bumped into this, and some of you are about to bump into this, and some of you, you've got a little ways, but you're, we're all going to bump into it. Anytime you try to control things and steer things and hold things and say, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to achieve this, and I, I'm going to push my career, and I'm going to make sure that things at the office, or I'm going to make sure the things at the, you know, the sports league 
you know, wind up the way that I want, what happens is we bump into this thing where we create a bigger problem that should have been because we're trying to control it. And then we realize, I've messed this whole thing up. Every time I try, the stronger I try to hold on to this, the stronger I try to direct this, it just gets worse. And some of you are sitting there thinking, that's, that's exactly where I'm at right now. And here's the thing, it, it, the amazing thing about Jesus is, Jesus has a remarkable ability to save that is, which is surrendered to him. Jesus has a remarkable ability to save that which is surrendered to him. And, and some of you are in that position where it's like, you know what you need to do instead of trying to save the situation or rectify the situation or clean up the mess, some of you just need to turn palms up and just say, God, I need saving right now. I need a redeemer. I need, a, I need to be rescued from this because it is a mess and it is way beyond my ability. And some of you, I just tell you what, you'll save yourself a lot of regret if you get to this posture sooner. Say, I'm trying to control them, I'm trying to control that, and, 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 and honestly, if you keep on down that road, you're going to really, really mess it up. So just turn palms up, just say, you know what, I, I need help. I need help. Because I realize God sent me a Savior for a reason. He sent you a Savior for a reason, and that reason is you need saving. Like, you can't do this. And if you keep on trying to do it on your own, if, if you tr keep trying to improve all the, you, you just need to turn palms up and say, God, I, I need your help. I need to release that situation, that relationship, or I just need saving. I need a redeemer. I need to be rescued. Luke chapter 2, verse 10. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. For I bring you good news that will cause great joy. See, when you realize that God sent you a Savior because he loves you and because you have worth to him to begin with, not because of what you've done, but just because you do, all of a sudden it just re relaxes you. It's like, you I mean, I, I don't have to try to attain to a level to make sure that I'm accepted? No. God loves you right where you are just as you are. And when that truth goes from here to here, you know what happens here? A flood of joy. And you can relax and rest in that. Good news that will cause great joy for all the people. For today in the town of David, a what? A Savior has been born to you. We read one of the most familiar verses earlier, John 3.16. This is the verse that comes right after it that is just as important. It says this, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn. He didn't send Jesus to wag his finger and say, you are so screwed up, how dare you? God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to what? Save the world. You know why he sent him to save us? Because we need a savior. Not a helper, not a king, not a coach, not a mentor. We need to be saved. And then Paul writes, Romans chapter 5, you see at just the right time, while we were still, what's that word? Some of you are in that position right now where it's just dawned on you. I can't change this. I can't fix this. This is beyond my ability. I have no power or influence over the situation anymore. Uh-oh. Uh and here's the reality. That's where we start. We're, we're powerless but at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for us, the ungodly. One of my favorite passages uh, is found in Colossians chapter 1. It says this, verse 13, for he has rescued us. That word rescue, the word picture of that is somebody reaching down and plucking someone up out of a disaster. That's what it means, to be rescued, like, like they're going down unless somebody reaches down and grabs them and pulls them out of it. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. Do you realize our world is dark? Like you follow the news, right? You follow what happens in the world. And this is, I mean, this, we could say this any time. And there's darkness in our world. There's evil in our world. But it's not just out there, is it? I mean, if we were to be honest, there's darkness in our own heart. 
like left on our own. I mean, you know the things that you've thought. You know the things that you've done that no one else knows about. The reality is there is darkness within us. It's not just out there, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. We live and exist in that dominion and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. In other words, he's bringing us into a good spot in whom we have what? Redemption, the forgiveness of sins. My goodness. That God has come and he has redeemed us. He has rescued us. He has forgiven us in Christ. And that is why the news of Christmas is good. It's good. Because you and I need a Savior. That's what you need. And that's what I need. And the, sooner, and the sooner we embrace this reality that it's not just, you know, like God saved me for eternity, but it's, it's in the here and now, the sooner that we understand that, the more uh, free we'll be internally. The, the more we understand, you know what, instead of trying to grab onto life like this, I just, I just turn it up and say, God, you know what? <sighs> You're the Redeemer. You're the Savior. You're the one who rescues. And so I, I just want to live like this. That's how I want to live. You know, in thinking about all of this for today, I just thought, you know, what, what's the action step that we need to take? And honestly, I don't know what that action step is for you. Like, I had a couple ideas, I thought, and I thought, you know, what, 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 what do we do walking out of here today? And so because I'm not sure what that would mean for you, I, I thought it would be better just to ask some questions. Some questions that you need to answer for yourself, like you need to honestly answer for yourself. And that will give you the direction. It's like when you answer these questions, it'll be like, now I know what I need to do. All right? So here's the first question. The first question is this. What do I need to surrender to Jesus? Right? What is it in my life that I need to surrender? What is it in my life that I'm trying to control and I'm trying to direct and I just realize, you know what, it's going off the rails right now. The wheels are getting a little lobby, wobbly. What is it that I need to surrender to him? Like, you don't have to be a, a Christian to understand this, but you can, but, but for followers of Jesus, you say, you know what? Like, I'm trusting God for my eternity, but I am not trusting him for my marriage. I am not trusting him with my parents. I am not trusting him with my school. I'm not trusting him with my career, my finances, my, you know, what, what is it that you need to say, you know what? I'm surrendering. I, I, I'm just going to go. Jesus, I'm trying to control, and I'm worrying myself, and I'm wearing myself out trying to affect the outcome or the conclusion of all this, and I just need to stop, and I just need to say, you know what, I'm just trusting you because you're the Savior. Like, you're the Redeemer. You're the one who rescues and buys back and purchases freedom for, and so I'm just going to surrender this to you. What is that in your life? Maybe it's your... Maybe it's your job. Maybe things in your job right now, you're trying to get ahead and you're trying to, and, and, and maybe you're, you're just force-fitting something in that shouldn't be force-fit in. And you just need to say, you know what, I, I, just, I just need to surrender this. Maybe you're trying to control a spouse and, and, and you don't like what they're doing or, and, and you're trying to like, you know, hammer away at them and nag and this and, you know, throw these little lob bombs. And I just, the question is, how's that working for you, Right. My guess is probably not real good. And and you just need to say, you know, what does it look like to surrender myself to Jesus in this relationship? What does it mean for me to surrender myself to Jesus in my marriage? What does it mean to surrender my children to him? What does it mean to surrender my parents to him? What does it mean to surrender my siblings? I I just, because I'm, I'm trying and it's just not working. And what is it that you need to surrender your finances or I don't know what it is, but what is it? And then what does it look like for you to, to, to give that up to him, to trust him with that? You need to answer that question. All of us. I mean, there's not a person in here who doesn't need to answer that question. All of us need to answer this question. Here's another one. Why haven't I said yes to following Jesus? Like, there are some of you, you, you come to church on a, you know, sometimes frequently, I don't know how frequently or infrequently, and it's not that you don't believe, like you, you believe in God, and really you would even say, I, I, I even believe in Jesus, and so my question is, what, what is it that keeps you from going all in on following Jesus? Why do you have one foot in and one foot out? What is it? And here's the thing, there's a reason why 
that you're not all in for Jesus. There's a reason why you haven't surrendered your life fully to him, and you need to figure out what is that reason? Why can't I go all in for Jesus? And if you dig down on that question enough, what you'll probably come up with is it's probably a fear of losing control of your life, like, you know what, if I do that, then I'm going to have to go to be a missionary on a mission field, and I really don't want to do that. Or I'm going to have to give up, you know, this part of my life, and I really enjoy doing that, and I don't want to give that part of it up, and it's probably some kind of a, a fear that's driving that. Or maybe you have objections to Christianity or to the Bible, and you're like, I don't believe, you know, Jonah was swallowed by a fish. And, and all of a sudden, what we're doing is we're putting up all these smoke screens. Because at the end of the day, it's not about did Jonah get swallowed by a fish. It's not about all those other things. It's just like, you know what, what am I afraid of? What do I feel like I'm going to lose if I say yes to Jesus? And the answer, the honest answer is you're not going to lose anything. Jesus said, what will it be if you gain the whole world and yet forfeit your soul? And if you give up your life for my sake, you'll find it. It's like, you know why there are people who fill, you know, rooms like this every week? It's not because they lost a bunch of stuff. It's because they gained so much by following Jesus. That's why they keep coming back. That's why we keep saying, you know what, something uh, amazing that's happening inside my heart. So my question is, why haven't you said yes to fully following Jesus? You owe yourself an answer to that question. You need to be, get really honest with yourself. And here's the, here's the third question. Why haven't I said yes to being baptized? Like some of you are like, yeah, I'm, I'm all in for Jesus. I'm like, yeah, but you've never done this. Why is that? I mean, really honestly, what is it? Well, I'm afraid my hair is going to get wet. Well, it is, all right? <laughs> and some of you, you don't even have any hair. So what's your deal? <laughs> what is it? What does it say? Yeah, I'm a follower of Jesus, but that, this right here, I don't know about that. You know what? Here's the thing. If you, if you waved the flag and surrendered and just said, you know what, I'm all in for Jesus, then why wouldn't you want everyone to know it? And some of you, you've been holding out on this. But honestly, why? I mean, you owe yourself an honest answer to that question. What, what do I need to surrender to Jesus in my life? What, what is it in my life that I need to surrender to him? Why haven't I said yes to really all in following Jesus? What, what's holding me back? What fear is it? What, what thing do I think I'm going to give up that's gonna, that I'm going to miss so terribly? Why haven't I said yes to being baptized? I think when you answer these questions, man, it, it's going to give you what your next step is. It's going to give you like this week, today, I need to do X. Like I need to make a phone call, I need to have a conversation, or I just need to drop that all together. What is it? What is it? Because here's the reality. I need a Savior. You need a Savior. And the reason you and the reason I need a Savior is because I'm on the perishing road without Jesus. Like, I, I have no hope for eternity without Jesus, and I'm going to mess up my life without Jesus. I need a Savior, and so do you. And some of you just need to say, you know, I, I don't care who knows. I, I, I'm like all in. In, the, in fact, you know, if you were drowning in the ocean, and I wasn't drowning, but I was getting close to it. If you were drowning in the ocean, you wouldn't say, you know what, I, I don't want to yell for help. That'd be embarrassing. You're like, I really don't care who knows I'm drowning. I'm drowning. I don't want to, I don't want to die. I'm like, help, help, help. And I was not too far away from that in the ocean that day. And some of you just need to say, I don't care who knows. Like, I need to be rescued. How many of you would say, I, I need to be rescued? Anybody? Come on. Yeah. I need to be rescued. I've got good news. And it's going to bring great joy. Jesus is your rescuer. He is your savior. And when you turn your life over to him, when you surrender, guess what he does? He saves. He rescues. He redeems. Let's pray. God, thank you that you are a savior, that you sent a savior to us. And it's not about trying to bring our best to you. And it's not about trying to live up to some, you know, menial standard to try to get some acceptance or approval or worth from you. That you love us 
period. And that is why you sent Jesus. Not because we had done something good, but because we were, we were hopelessly lost without you. God, I, I pray that this Christmas season, that this truth of Jesus being a Savior and the fact that we need a Savior just completely transforms our heart. And that as a response, we just have uh, um, just an outflow of devotion, an outflow of emotion that comes and just says, thank you, thank you for saving me. Thank you for being a rescue to me. Thank you for being a, a redeemer to me. Because God, we admit and we confess right now, we need to be saved. We need to be rescued. We need to be redeemed. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.